Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Food Waste and Diversion in New York State webinar. I'm Jeanette Sanziano with the New York State Association of Counties. Just want to go through a couple of very brief housekeeping points. During the webinar, if you have a question that you would like to um, ask our speakers, we request that you type in your questions on the dashboard under questions and then submit it. And then in the last 15 minutes of the program, we will go through as many of the questions as we can. Any questions that we don't get to, we will follow up via email. Um, we also want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on the NYSAC website at NYSAC.org uh, probably after 3 o'clock today, both the recording and a PDF of the slide deck. I'd like to now introduce Stephen Aquario, Executive Director of the New York State Association of Counties. Thank you, Jeanette Stanziano, and welcome to our members uh, who have joined us here today. Uh, we're very excited about uh, this presentation here. Uh, it's a very specific presentation, and we're very pleased to have uh, such a wide variety of officials who've called in today and also representative of the entire state of New York. So we have uh, from all corners of the state, uh, this beautiful state of New York, uh, all these officials have taken the time to join us today. Very excited that you've uh, chosen to spend what we'll say about an hour uh, this morning going over food waste and diversion in New York State. This is a topic that we have been working on for several years. Uh, I have personally uh, assisted uh, Albany County and Saratoga County in their desire to establish a digester, and I'm very excited for the progress that they are making in Albany and Saratoga County. And I have personally toured the Oneida County facility in a very innovative and exciting uh, digester operation uh, in Oneida County, New York, the Oneida Herkimer uh, Solid Waste Facility uh, located in Utica, New York. Uh, a wonderful opportunity to see that, and I encourage a group tour. And hopefully Bill Rabia, who is with us here today uh, to discuss Oneida County's and Ida Herkimer's success in this can host us for a live group tour. And we'll be scheduling that with Alexandra Lamont of our office here at the Association of Counties. So again, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this is a webinar about New York State's new food diversion law and what counties can do. <laughs> what counties can do uh, to reduce uh, the amount of food uh, that's wasted and sent to landfills in their communities. Uh, I think that uh, food waste uh, is, is apparent that it's a, a global problem, uh, in, in particular the United States, with a far-reaching impact on food security, resource conservation, and of course, climate change. Uh, some estimates nearly half of the food grown and processed and transported in the United States goes to waste and I think that's about 20 to 30 percent of our landfill space as well uh, that is being taken into our uh, landfills and, of course, producing methane gas. What does it look like? On average, Americans waste about 25 percent of the food that's purchased. That's 150,000 tons of food that's wasted each day. That breaks down to roughly a pound of food for a person per day. Uh, that's about 40 percent of the food waste in the United States. In addition to food that consumers waste at home, 50 billion pounds of food uh, from consumer-facing businesses like grocery stores and restaurants, commercial food produ producers ends up in landfills uh, every year. Again, it represents another 40% of the food waste pie. Uh, for the past few years, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, has advanced legislation uh, to establish a food diversion program and we're very proud that our governor submitted it this year again in 2019 as part of the state budget and the state legislature taking bold action to adopt that law, rescuing more food that would have otherwise gone to waste and feed people in need. So effective on January 1st of 2022, New York will join five other states to mandate that food waste from certain businesses, commercial food producers be diverted from landfills through donation or food scrap recycling. And here to discuss this new law is Sally Rowland, uh, an environmental engineer from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the Division of Materials Management. 
We'll also be joined by Missy Hall, a pollution prevention engineer from the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, or P2I, uh, the Honorable Mana Joe Green, an Ulster County Legislator and Chair of the Ulster Energy Environment Committee. Of course, Bill Rabia, as I've mentioned earlier, the Director of the Oneida Herkimer Solid Waste Authority. And here with us right now to give uh, a host county welcome, if you will, our Chair of our NISAC Climate Resiliency Committee, the Honorable Mark Polencars, who's invested quite a bit uh, on this issue and addressing climate change and county efforts to meet the Paris Accord in Erie County. I'd like to welcome and thank Mark Polencars. Mark, I'll turn it over to you to kick off this webinar. Thanks, Steve, and thanks everyone for participating. Uh, this is a, an important and growing issue. Uh, I think as we all know, one of the biggest uh, issues that is facing uh, our community and our country is uh, issues related to climate change and resiliency, which is why I'm very pleased to be the chair of the Climate Resiliency Committee in NISAC. But as goes into that are issues associated with handling waste. And food waste is a huge problem in the United States. According to the EPA, uh, we throw more food into trash than any other material, uh, the equivalent of about $165 billion each year. Uh, and that's why uh, we need to work together to find ways to eliminate uh, the, the food waste issue from people wasting it, but also what we can do uh, to take advantage of it if it should happen to enter into our, our waste stream. So that's why I encourage everyone in this webinar to work together to, to first off, to thank you for being part of the webinar, uh, but then to educate your residents, encourage donation of edible food, and look for ways to promote food scrap recycling, as you're, some of them you're going to hear. There's only so much we can do with our landfills in the, in the the, the more we can keep material out of our landfills, the better. Uh, it certainly has an impact locally, and as we know, uh, it's, a, it's a regional and national issue as well. Uh, we do have an obligation to promote a cleaner, greener planet, and one of those ways is to make certain that edible food is actually eaten <laughs> and not thrown into our, uh, our system because, of course, it, it creates all kinds of other issues with the, uh, the creation of methane gases and other gases that then enter into our atmosphere and have an impact with regards to the issues we're dealing with with climate change. So uh, while counties have certainly been a leader on this throughout the years, I think it's very important that we, we hear because we're really taking the lead on this. You don't see cities generally dealing with this issue. And of course, this is not a, in some ways a state or national issue. It's often the counties that are dealing with this issue because we are the ones that are in the, the greatest position to handle it, dealing with our local municipalities. So uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, playing a role by participating in this webinar. webinar. I want to thank NISAC, Steve Aquario, Alex Lamonte, and the rest of the staff for uh, putting this together and, and getting some very good speakers to help us uh, learn more about the, the, uh, the, the topic, as well as uh, working with our, our friends in state government, uh, coming up with solutions that we believe are applicable for solving this issue as we go forward. We have to do it. Uh, our landfills are getting full to the extent that uh, we're having problems across uh, this country with landfills reaching their peak. Uh, we see what's happening with China no longer accepting certain goods from the United States. Uh, we've got to be able to control the waste that's being produced by our citizens. And if we have a way of doing that, especially as it pertains to food waste, by first of all, eliminating the food waste from entering the waste stream in the first place, we're going to be so much better for it. But when it does enter the stream, we have to find a way to to utilize it in a manner that, that doesn't have a negative impact on our on our, our climate as well as our planet's long-term future. So with that, I'll turn it back to everyone and just thank all for participating in this important discussion. Thank you. That was the Honorable Mark Polencars, the Erie County Executive, again, the chair of the NISAC Resiliency Committee. If you're interested in this committee, uh, please contact Alexandra Lamont at the NISAC offices and we can further engage you with this committee and the great work that Mark Polonkars has been doing and trying to pull together best practices from across the state. What are the counties doing uh, to address uh, climate change, uh, renewable energy type projects, and many other uh, creative solutions to address uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and uh, conserve energy, save taxpayer dollars. Uh, Mark Polonkars leading that charge. And again, if you would like to become a member of this committee or otherwise learn about this, the activities of this committee, please contact our offices 
uh, Alexandra Lamont. So let's go to Sally Rowland, uh, again, the environmental engineer uh, for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the Div Division of Materials Management. Are you with us, Sally? Yes, good morning. Uh, hey, good morning. Thanks. Good morning to everybody who's joining. I'd like to take just a second to uh, recognize the Steve and the good work of the Association of Counties in putting together this webinar and certainly in being very proactive in supporting efforts in this realm. It's important to us, as you can imagine, but we certainly appreciate the help of the Association of Counties and also recognize uh, Erie County for being forward in this. Uh, as Mark mentioned, it's many times on the local level, county level, that things get done more than they do on the state level, and otherwise federal level. So we appreciate the Erie County certainly taking the lead in this effort. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the recently passed law legislation in New York State affecting food donation and food scraps recycling. As you can imagine, we're going to talk about the specifics of who this applies to, but I certainly want to emphasize that this doesn't mean that others, smaller generators, can't be involved in this as well. Part of our initiative in this legislation is to kind of kickstart uh, facility growth and other activities and increase food donations so that others that are interested can join as well, even if they're not obligated to under the law. Okay, next slide, please. So what does the law look like? I'm going to go over it briefly. Certainly you can take it's not too hard to read. It's pretty short. So if you want to read the law itself, you look under Article 27. It's the new Title 22. So it's titled Food Donation, Food Scraps, Recycling. And if you look in the specifics, it's broken into these different parts, definitions, designated food scraps generator responsibilities, which we'll talk about in a little more detail in a minute, transporter requirements, transfer stations, which we now call transfer facilities, other intermediate responsibilities. And then on the next slide, we talk about the remainder, the food scraps disposal prohibition, what the department is obligated to do, what are our responsibilities, regulations that we will be developing, exclusions or who is not affected by the law, and preemption and severability, which is, if you're familiar with regulations and legislation, it's just kind of a catch-all that if uh, something is deemed inappropriate in the law or the, we do it in the regs too, then the rest of it remains effective. Okay. All right, so the first uh, question always is who is affected by the law? In this case, what we're looking at is what's called a designated food scraps generator, which really means a larger generator. This is not your mom and pop kind of corner grocery store or something like this. This is the larger generators, which we define as generating two tons per week on an annual average at a single location. We're all familiar with grocery store chains. They're the easiest ones to think of in this realm, the Price Choppers, Wegmans, others like that. Their individual stores, for the most part, fall under this. It has to be a fairly large restaurant, so it would have to be like an Olive Garden or a chain like that to qualify could be malls, could be college campuses. So anyone who falls in that realm of generation. How the nitty gritty of how it's determined when you get to a mall, we'll talk about that a little bit. So the first question becomes, how do you figure out how much they generate when it comes to food scraps? So as you can imagine, a grocery store doesn't know necessarily. They know what they pay for. They may pay a transporter to come and pick up a dumpster so many times a week, but they don't know how much food scraps necessarily is in that dumpster. So it's not an easy, they don't know offhand if they generate two tons or more. One way to do that is there's been a number of calculators developed across the United States to look at other factors like uh, number of employees or number of college students, so other things, number of beds in the hospital to say, how does that other factor that's more easily known correlate to how much food scraps you generate. This is just an example of three out there. P2I, which we work with P2I to develop a map just for New York State. There's also one in Massachusetts because they've had laws longer than us about the same thing and in California. So these are just examples if you want to go look up what are called these calculators to estimate food scraps generation. So if we just take an example, 
Um, this one I took from Recycling Works in Mass, but you could use P2I as well. If you're a restaurant, as I said, if you don't know how much, obviously if you do know, that's great. If you, you know, are very proactive and measure your waste or something like that, and you know the exact amount, perfect. But if you don't, this gives you an idea based on these different factors of how much you probably do generate. You don't have to know all of these even. You could pick one. Obviously, the more you know, the more accurate your number you'll probably get. But at least you should know the full-time employees you have or even how much disposal you have from that. And these calculators, you can estimate how much you generate. So for the two tons per week, it's, as I say, it's a fairly large restaurant, 140 full-time employees, 8,000 meals. This is a, a large establishment. We estimate there's about 1,200 generators in the state that will probably qualify. New York City is excluded. We'll talk about that a little. So 1,200 does not include New York City generators. Next, please. Again, for hospitals, same kind of thing. But again, you would imagine here it's looking at you know, meals served. So how much you know activity, even you can look at for the hospital, how many beds are in the hospital as an estimator. So this gets at, again, how can you go about figuring out how much you generate on a yearly basis. Okay. One last one, just quickly, same kind of thing. It's nursing home. What they're trying to get at here is something that's readily known. Beds in a nursing home, meal served. So the amount you generate, and again, these are not perfect either. When it comes to different establishments, obviously not all grocery stores are run the same. Some have, you know, fresh fruit, fresh food that's served there. So there's going to be some variance, but this at least gives you an idea if you're in the ballpark. All right, so back to, you know, that's how you go about gen figuring out who generates two tons. What is food scraps to start with? And the definition basically comes down to inedible food and food contaminated papers. And edible food that doesn't end up being donated. So obviously it's going to end up in the waste stream. We don't uh, obviously require seized or recalled foods, but many times they can be recycled. You know, if it's being uh, recalled by USDA or a federal agency because of mislabeling, that doesn't mean it can't be recycled. Like uh, a couple of years ago, we had cases, truckloads of water that was mislabeled. There was nothing wrong with the water, so it ended up going to an anaerobic digest. But there may be cases where it's not appropriate. So we want, really want to handle those case by case. Um, when it comes to where is it going, what we call an organics recycler, that's where the food scraps are going to end up. Most people are pretty familiar with composting. But there's other technologies out there, other types of ways to recycle food scraps. Rendering, we're familiar with, with fats and things like that. Animal feed is sometimes produced from grains and other materials. Digestion, fermentation. So it, we're, not, we're trying not to make it uh, very uh, exclusive. There's lots of technologies out there that work. We want to recognize them and allow them to be used. The key to organic recycling is the result material is beneficial use. Usually it's a soil amendment, but we don't want the material obviously to go to these facilities and then to go to a landfill. We want the material to go to these, through these facilities and the result material be beneficial use because it has good organic matter in it. Single location, there's some confusion sometimes about a mall. Say so you have a mall with multiple food vendors. Do you count each one? Do you count them together under the mall? What we're trying to say is who's responsible for solid waste management. So if you have a large anchor restaurant and they do their own, then they're responsible at the mall. If they're all handled by mall management, then the total amount is counted. As Steve mentioned, uh, the effective date of these, we have a little breathing room here to get it, figure out what we're all going to do because it's not till January 1st, 2022. And what does it say happens that day? On that day, all generators Again, these are the designated, the larger generators, must separate excess food for donation. We certainly recognize that grocery stores commonly do this already. They, they donate food. What we're trying to get at is helping through education and relationships between generators and local pantries and food banks. There's certainly more material they could go for donation than is now. And working with the other kind of generators, restaurants and colleges, so we're trying to up that to make it even better than it is now. As well as uh, donation, if there's an organic recycler within 25 miles 
of one of these generators, they have to separate their food scraps and send them to the a recycler. They could recycle on site, they could do other things, but again, it has to be 25 miles and it has to be viable, meaning the cost is not excessive. But if it is, that's a viable option, they have to be using that. One exception, if you happen to be in a location where they can handle mixed waste, Delaware County is the big example, they can handle mixed waste because they have processing at their facility to separate out non-compostables. So, so it's not necessary for the generator to recycle those. They all also have a separate recycling program, so it's not like all waste goes in that material, but anything that ends up in there, they can remove. Okay. So what is a, the large generators or the designated food scraps generators have to do as well as separate? They have to do some reporting. We're trying to make this as simple as possible through electronic reporting to us, simple forms. We just wanna know how much they do, donated and what was recycled and where it went. So we're be, gonna be developing that online kind of form, forms. There also is provisions in the law and, and will be in the regulations about temporary waivers. We understand there's gonna be situations that it just doesn't work. You can't recycle for some reason. But you have to prove to the department that you know the cost is, uh, is significantly higher than landfilling or a facility that seemed to be viable is not. So if you provide that proof to the department, you can get a waiver for up, but you're limited to a year in, donation, year in duration, but they can be renewed. All right, that's on the generator end. So the generator has gone to all this work. You're the Wegmans, you've separated your food scraps. You know, you're all set to send it to a digester on a farm 20 miles away. Well, what about the guy or gal that picks up the food, the transporter? There's an obligation under the law to make sure it gets to where it's supposed to be. So the transporter has to deliver the food to a recycler or to someone else that's going to send it to a recycler. It could be a transfer facility could be even an intermediate processor. So obviously we want an obligation to make sure they hold up their end of the bargain that the transporters deliver it where it's supposed to go. Okay. Also, of course, that transfer facility. Many times, uh, if it's going a little further distance, it will be combined at a transfer facility into bigger trucks, it's just more economical. We wanna tell those transfer facilities or other processors you have an obligation to keep the stuff moving down the line to the recycler. Okay. And there's a, a prohibition. Uh, of course, the same kind of thing. We wanna make sure that that material, after it's gone all to the effort to separate it and there's organics recycling available, that it doesn't end up in a landfill or combustor. So there's a prohibition in the law that says combustion facilities and landfills, they can't accept it. We know, you know, they, there's some reasonableness to, you know, obviously these provisions and will be in the regulation that they can't, uh, we don't expect them to be checking every bag on every load. But obviously if there's a load full of food scraps or something like that, that's very obvious, we will expect the landfills and combustors to be flagging that kind of material. Okay, what do we have to do? Uh, the law outlines a number of responsibilities for the department. We have to publish, on our website methodology for how we determine who's generators, waivers. We have to uh, assess capacities. In the next couple of years, we'll be working and certainly be uh, looking for any assistance we can get from association and others and how we uh, develop these lists of who's out there. Obviously, we already have a lot of information on the facilities. We're also gonna be developing educational materials. We know the generators, you know, may not be familiar with what they can do with the material, they may not be familiar with donation options. So there's certainly gonna be information needed to help them out. Also for municipalities, just to use for their homeowners. Not that there's any obligation to homeowners under this law, but we certainly wanna provide information for homeowners on how to reduce the amount of food scraps they generate, because a lot of food scraps are generated in the home. And we have to do rules and regs. We'll certainly be very proactive in discussing what's in them. They're going to be called Part 350, but they're also going to be implementing rules for this legislation. We'll be looking for your help in commenting and making them uh, implementable. Okay. I did mention there's a couple exclusions in here uh, to the law. One is New York City or a city of one million or more, if you will. 
because they already have their own law. They do voluntary residential and mandatory commercial food scraps recycling in New York City. So they already go beyond what the state law says. So we didn't feel the need to impose this on them as well. But if they ever change their law in the future and don't do it, they will then be obligated. Also, hospitals, nursing homes, adult care facilities, elementary and secondary schools are currently out, but we work with them. Certainly many are proactive and want to do this as well. Okay. Thank you again. Uh, you're going to hear about some neat projects going on in the state next, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, Sally, thanks so much. Uh, and Sally will be with us. Let me encourage folks to uh, submit questions uh, on your screen. We're going to take questions at the end, but you could always log them in now. Uh, we are going to do a, a frequently asked question FAQ following this webinar and then distribute it or post it on the NISAC website uh, this afternoon, as Jeanette Stanziano of our office mentioned. We're now joined by Missy Hall, uh, a pollution prevention uh, engineer uh, for the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, or P2I. And we're very grateful that um, Missy is here with us. Um, Missy will go over and make available, we're very excited, additional resources. Uh, for our membership, the counties, the officials from across the state that are joining us here. Uh, Missy and the Pollution Prevention Institute is located at uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology, or RIT, in Rochester, New York, and they are working with uh, local governments presently, and hopefully more, on reducing food waste. So they have lots of resources, and we're very grateful that you're with us, Missy. So we'll turn it over to you at this point. Thank you, um, and thanks for everybody who's on the, the webinar today. Um, as introduced, I'm one of the, the staff engineers here at the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, and I will be talking about some of the resources and services we have available to New York State and its municipalities. Next slide. Um, so briefly, uh, we're located in the Rochester, at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. We've been around for just over 10 years and have annual funding in, administered through the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. We have lots of focus areas within our organization. I'll specifically be talking about our service offerings that uh, center around food waste management and food waste diversion from landfill. But as you can see on the slide, we do a lot of other um, we do a lot of other services, including outreach and education, some R&D work, focus on emerging contaminants, and supply chain sustainability. Next slide. Um, we, in addition to being located in Rochester, we have a lot of partners around the state that allow us to uh, provide the same kind of a service to businesses, organizations, and uh, municipalities, the same level of service that we do in our own backyard in Rochester. Um, so that is a, a map of some of the partners that we have. Next slide. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here. Our, the slide deck will be available at the end of the uh, webinar when it uh, gets posted, but when we when we do work with companies or organizations on our direct technical assistance. This is the type of scope that um, that assistance would look like. So using our funding through New York State DEC, we're able to provide direct technical assistance at low to no cost. Um, we work on specific tasks that range of two to six months to help identify and implement sustainable solutions. Next slide. So as Sally mentioned, you know, there are some resources. Uh, well, I guess Sally touched on it a little bit. Um, there are resources through DEC that provide assistance or capital, sorry, excuse me, that pro provide funding to uh, municipalities around food waste management through climate smart communities and other funding streams. I'm going to, next slide, um, talk more specifically about what P2I has to offer as well as our parent university with, a, with RIT. We have direct technical assistance, which I just talked about briefly. Uh, we have our online resources, 
and a community grant program. We, at the end of the presentation, I'll also spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, $4 million of funding we have through Empire State Development, which is for capital reimbursement. Next slide. So getting a little bit more in detail on our, our technical assistance, um, again, we provide this across a lot of different um, types of um, needs related to sustainability, but this is focused on our food waste sector. Um, so we work with food related businesses and organizations or municipalities that are seeking to improve food waste management practices. Uh, we may do some quantifying, uh, looking at opportunities for prevention and diversion, assisting in overcoming challenges associated with food waste management, and then we also participate in training and education. Next slide. You know, as an example, we recently completed work with um, a small municipality that were looking to make a difference in their own community by um, collecting food scraps from a few local businesses as well as residents and introducing that into their um, sludge composting operation at their wastewater treatment plant. So we worked with them to create an implementation plan of running a pilot and broadening the scope of their operation as well as helping them with a composting trial to see what the logistics as well as the you know technical nuances would be as they continue to um, incorporate food scraps into their composting. Uh, we worked shoulder to shoulder with them to engage local stakeholders and help to develop that plan of scaling up their process. So as a result, um, they've been diverting approximately 2,000 pounds of food waste from landfill each month from the few local businesses that started the program, but hopefully will continue to expand over time. Next slide. So moving on into some of our online resources, um, you know, we, I do have at the end of this presentation, a list of resources that I'll be talking about throughout, um, so uh, that you can save for the end. Um, Part of our online resource offerings is directed at the business and at businesses and institutions to provide them actionable guides and tools for implementing programs. And a lot of that is based on work that we've done with individual businesses that we then turn into rep replicable tools that allow the um, expansion of the effort that we did with that single business. Um, some of the examples of things that are on our, our website include, as Sally mentioned, an organic resource locator map that allows um, businesses and uh, food waste processors to see what other, um, you know, other businesses are in their area and approximately how much waste is being generated out of that business. We have our food waste calculator that Sally mentioned as well as things like step-by-step -step guidance documents that help uh, businesses understand how to reduce and divert their food waste. Next slide. We also have resources targeting or for municipal governments. Um, you know, there are a lot of great resources already out there that are directed at residents to educate them on what to do with their food waste, but we're really looking to provide tools directed at municipalities that help them implement programs within their own communities. Um, some of our initial tools that we have available on our website, and we are continuing to expand these um, mm -hmm. tools, include a municipal planning guide that talks through the high level steps of introducing a food waste management program, as well as um, you know a customizable fact sheet to prevent food waste at home. And what's different about this one as compared to some that are out there online already is it's the customization of it so that municipalities can download this from our website and then add specific material related to your community, whether it's drop-off information, um, you know, a hotline or a phone number for questions, uh, things of that nature so that you know, you have something with your branding on it that you can give to your residents. Next slide. 
just a, I won't go into too much detail on this. Um, we have a pretty packed schedule today on this webinar, but just to go in a little bit more detail on the food waste management planning guide that we have on our website, the three steps are, you know, organizing your management plan, defining the nuances of it, establishing objectives, and then implementing that plan. Um, and, you know, we, we see the value in taking some time up front in the investigation planning side of things to increase the likelihood of successful implementation rather than jumping right into a pilot and having it run indefinitely and not understanding, you know, what, what success looks like for you. So we really are trying to provide resources to do more of that upfront work to help save time in the long run. Next slide. So transitioning a little bit, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do have a community grants program available through P2I. Um, and this is, we've done um, since our inception, we've funded over 100 community projects, um, which is translate to over $1.5 million of funding to New York State communities. Um, and this is another opportunity for municipalities to have access to some funding to work on P2 related projects, food waste related or not. Um, you know, our most recent RFA is now closed, but we should be announcing the next cycle at the end of July. Um, you can also see past work on our website of projects that um, are mentioned here. Next slide. A couple of examples of food waste related work, um, you know, Tompkins County, Hudson Valley Regional Council and Radix Ecological Sustainability Center have done some great projects um, that you can see here, um, really done impactful work within their own communities with education of residents, uh, gleaning food from farms and looking at educating residents on compost collection. Next slide. Uh, the, the final topic area for us to discuss today from a P2I perspective is looking at the $4 million in capital funding that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, we are collaborating with the Empire State Development to administer a $4 million grant um, that allows businesses, organizations, and municipalities to apply for reimbursement up to 44% of eligible equipment expenses as it relates to diverting food waste from landfill or incineration. So this is focused on those groups that are generating the material, not processing. But uh, next slide goes into a little bit more detail. So, uh, as I said, you have to be generating one, approximately one ton or more of food waste per week on average to be eligible. Um, there is contact information and a link to the page with more detail specific to this project or excuse me, program offering, um, you know, things like dehydrators or totes, um, you know, in vessel composting systems would be the types of things that would be eligible under this program. Next slide. Um, just to wrap things up, uh, here is a list of the, um, the links that I mentioned throughout the presentation that you can uh, save for a later date. And last slide. Next slide. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Um, the contact information for P2I is there. Any emails sent through this address. Uh, with questions about food waste will end up coming to me. So feel free to use that. Um, and I appreciate being on this webinar today. Thank you very much. Melissa Hall, uh, that was Melissa Hall. Thank you, Melissa, for uh, a fantastic condensed version of uh, all the great work that you're doing at the Rochester Institute of Technology, the Pollution Prevention uh, Institute uh, located underneath the RIT. Uh, again, excellent resources. You can see here the contact information for Melissa, uh, the email, the phone number, and their website. Uh, very important information 
that was on slide 35 there talking about resources. If, if you can go back one slide, Jeanette, uh, a lot of resources that was glossed over by Melissa in the in, uh, interest of time. But again, very uh, helpful resources for the town, city, village officials that are with us, county officials that are with us today. And uh, again, we will have this information put up on our website at the end of today. We're gonna go to the Honorable Manna Joe Green, uh, an Ulster County legislator who has uh, dedicated a lot of time and effort into addressing environmental initiatives uh, in the Hudson Valley in Ulster County. Um, and we're, we're very pleased that legislator Manager Joe Green is with us uh, to discuss some of the food reduction projects within Ulster County. So I'll turn it over to Legislator Green. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, next. Um, I, I just want to say to begin that Ulster County um, went ahead and uh, formed a group to try to um, deal with food waste composting and develop legislation. And we did that because um, we have to do our 10 year uh, local solid waste management plan. The Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency is responsible for creating that uh, this year. And we wanted to be sure that this important component of the waste stream um, was going to the best possible use. Um, and we looked at a couple of the food waste or scrap, food scrap recovery hierarchies and um, EPAs we, uh, we found a high level of agreement with, um, source reduction, food to hungry people, and then uh, feeding animals. And the farmers in Ulster County uh, have a large stake at um, ensuring that that practice continues. We had a little bit of question about industrial use versus composting. Um, we feel that composting is very valuable. Um, yes, uh, fats and oils should be rendered, um, but some of the other industrial uses we think are sort of secondary. And then um, the last in both cases was landfill. And I thought this was interesting from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance source reduction, edible food rescue, um, residential backyard composting, and uh, small scale decentralized composting. So they're making the point that composting on site reduces transportation costs and emissions. Um, and then centralizing compost and anaerobic digestion, uh, they keep those two together as as we agreed and as the state does. Um, and then uh, mechanical biological mixed waste treatment, that includes um, MSW composting as is done in Delaware County and was referred to previously and then landfill. Next. So in terms of um, reduction and reuse, SUNY New Pulse um, has an amazing program uh, and, and they are, um, their food services, Sodexo, and I want to give them credit um, in the um, dorms, the, uh, the cafeterias that are located in the dorms have a green box choose to reuse uh, container so that there's very little waste um, associated with taking food out of the cafeteria. Um, there's an initial $5 fee and you can use that all year and it's, you know, a, a rotating system. Um, they also do very proactive food waste reduction education and um, their staff helps with the composting to be sure that uh, there's no contamination. Very strong education program. Um, food rescue programs, uh, first for reuse by people and then reuse by animals. Um, and there are uh, two interesting laws 
Um, one is the Good Samaritan Act, and the other is um, not a law, but it's a, a rebate a re, uh, from the IRS. Um, you, if you're donating food, you can actually take credit for that uh, as as a um, deduction. Um, and uh, to get back to the food waste reuse, um, we have uh, a farm to food program, uh, which is really excellent. A lot of the food pantries um, are coordinated through these programs. There's also an app you can put on your phone, um, and that is the um, Feed HV app. Um, and if you have an event, and the event is over and you have a lot of good usable food, um, you can go on this app and that will hook you up with transportation and a location to bring it to. Next. Um, so there are many different materials that can be and should be composted. Um, this is a list and a, and a pie chart showing the percentages. Um, I think most people are familiar with these, um, but basically organic biodegradable waste, and it's a significant portion of the waste stream and should be managed uh, because if not, if it goes to a landfill, it's putrescible, it adds to the odors and, and methane production and release. And if it goes to an incinerator, it's wet and it requires more heat and energy um, to combust. So uh, uh, the various ways of um, composting are right in the backyard in a simple heap or a chicken wire or concrete block or uh, a fancy igloo, and they even have small rotating drums for uh, backyard composting. Um, here in Ulster County, uh, a lot of businesses have already started uh, commercial and institutional fruit, food scrap composting, including SUNY New Pulse. Um, and they use a hauler and they send their material to uh, Greenway Environmental uh, Services. And they've really done a lot of pioneering work. And I'll mention that. Uh, a, a bit later. Um, Mohonk Mountain House and Frost Valley YMCA um, have been composting massive amounts of food waste on site and then using that on gardens and, uh, you know, in the case of Frost Valley, they actually grow food and then serve it back out on the table. Um, and then uh, some of our businesses are using anaerobic digestion. Um, Hannaford came and spoke at one of our stakeholder meetings, and they're already mandated in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont, so they're used to it. It works. It's not difficult. Supermarkets can participate, and they cho chose anaerobic digestion um, as opposed to composting, and that's fine. Next. Um, the various methods of composting, uh, there's passive and active. Uh, passive is basically a, a compost heap or a static pile, um, uh, but um, there really does have to be air moving through um, a compost pile to prevent it from um, going anaerobic and, um, and releasing methane. Active composting, um, prepares for that either by turning uh, a compost pile or a windrow or by uh, forcing air through um, the compost pile. So um, there is also in-vessel composting, which is in a building or a, a container. And um, some examples of that are tunnel composting systems, um, in vessel bays with mechanical agitation or um, a rotating drum. And if you use a rotating drum uh, to uh, blend the material and also decrease its size, then you need to use some other system. For example, in, in Delaware County, they start with a rotating drum and then they um, put it into the base with mechanical agitation. 
And then anaerobic digestion is under controlled circumstances uh, where biodegradable material is digested in the absence of oxygen to create and capture methane for use as a fuel to generate electricity. Um, and anaerobic conditions in landfills release methane, which can be captured, but very rarely is, especially in older landfills. Next. So here in Ulster County, the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency um, has an organics recovery facility, and they use what they call extended aerated static pile composting. So they have static piles. They are care, uh, very uh, carefully aerated to prevent um, the, the conditions from becoming anaerobic. Um, and you can see the material coming in. They compost year round, winter and summer. When the material is finished, um, it's put through a trommel screen and you see the um, certified compost product that comes out. Next. Um, and the Resource Recovery Agency and everyone here in Ulster County that's working on uh, food reduction, uh, reuse, and composting um, really stress the importance of education in preventing contamination and encouraging participation. So I mentioned that at SUNY New Paltz, um, and this is Melinda France and Antelina Pioni uh, at uh, the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency holding workshops um, for businesses and residents and going into schools. And uh, they have very good, clear educational materials that help uh, promote this excellent technology. Next. Um, they have some very interesting feedstocks. That's a whole pile of bread that came in. And you can see their facility, neat, clean, well-managed, um, and making an excellent product, which they sell in bag. And in addition, they earn um, $30 a ton uh, to, to do the processing, um, uh, but that's a lot less than the hundred and some odd dollar tipping fee. Um, so that's another incentive for businesses to participate. And you can see the results where um, 3,500 uh, tons a year um, of food waste is already being diverted. Um, and that reduces by 101 uh, trips and saves, um, you know, almost 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel and saves um, $364 in cost avoidance. And then you see the cumulative numbers to date since that process uh, went into effect back in 2012. Next. So uh, developing Ulster County's law, again, we just really wanted to be sure that this waste was managed uh, ahead of time. Uh, before we um, delved into what to do with what cannot be reduced, reused, repaired, or otherwise, you know, or composted or otherwise diverted. So we called together um, a task force of multiple stakeholders, large food waste generators, waste haulers, food waste processors, composting facilities. Um, in our county, we had four major facilities, and they were located all around the county, one on the uh, southeast corridor, the southwest corridor, and the northern uh, part of the county. Um, so we had um, lots of capacity, um, and we involved the relevant county departments and uh, worked very closely with the D DEC and this was before the state law was passed. We've been doing this for six months or more. Um, and uh, then when the state law was passed, we had to align our law, our work with the state law, so that when the state, ours is 
going to go into effect in 2020 if passed. And we believe it will be because it has such, it had such widespread stakeholder input. Um, and then uh, we held various meetings with um, the stakeholders. And in order to assess whether the capacity we had was adequate, we were able to use the data from the Pollution Prevention Institute um, to identify uh, our large generators. And there are 50 uh, facilities that generate more than a ton. And that totals uh, 153 tons per week. Um, and there are 150 facilities that generate more than half a ton per week. And they total another 45 tons tons a week. So you can see it's most important to get the larger generators. Uh, but we're trying we're going to try to include down to half a ton a week. Um, and also we have an Ulster County Green Business Challenge and food waste, uh, food reuse or composting qualifies as a climate solution. And I've listed the website if people want more information. Next. Um, these are a list of the haulers that are already participating. And I mentioned uh, Community Compost. They do both collection and processing. And then Greenway Environmental Services is one of the other, and that's uh, their facility actively at work. Next. Um, so by comparison, in New York State, uh, this the, this applies to um, businesses or institutions that generate two or more tons a week uh, from, it'll begin in 2022, and it, it goes on indefinitely. In Ulster County, um, it's two or more tons a week starting in 2020. In 2021, we expect to include those generators who generate between one and 1.9 tons a week. And if it, we're going to be um, asking for reporting and we're going to have an annual evaluation, and we expect to be able to go to three quarters of a ton in 2022 and to half a ton in 2023. In New York State, the distance from the composting facility uh, to a composting facility or a digester is 25 miles. We looked at Ulster County, and it can include everyone. Um, there is one corridor where it might be a little more than 25 miles, but they will not. They will be included, not exempt. Um, and the unfortunately, this slide got a little distorted. Um, in switching systems, but uh, the exemptions um, in New York State, schools and healthcare facilities are exempt. In Ulster County, they are not. However, um, there is a potential for waivers if there are really serious problems. The state, wait, go back, please. The state does not exempt pre and post-consumer, or it doesn't distinguish between pre- and post-consumer. In Ulster County, uh, for the businesses that are covered by the state, which is greater than two tons, we will not distinguish. But smaller businesses, if they have problems keeping contamination out of post-consumer food scraps, um, they can apply for a waiver. And at the state level, the DEC and Ag and Markets um, are responsible for education, reporting, and enforcement, and we're still working that out in Ulster County. Next. Um, this is a list of people who have been working on this project and are knowledgeable, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Manager Green from Ulster County, and a very uh, descriptive of all the efforts of Ulster County and what they continue to do in a very pro-environmental stance uh, in Ulster County. Grateful for your time. Before we go to uh, Bill Rabia, uh, I wanted to see if uh, Sally Rowland, uh, is, is, uh, Sally, are you still with us? 
One you have done the entire thing. Uh, I think we have. Okay. Sally, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, I just wanted to take a couple of questions before you leave. Um, and uh, I know you have to leave this call. Are planning units responsible for this annual reporting or will the responsibility be on the larger waste generators to report to the Department of Environmental Conservation? The reporting is for the large generators, not the planning units. Okay, can you uh, explain or expand on why schools and nursing homes are excluded? Um, for schools, it ended up there were only a couple schools in the state that were large enough generators, and we're already working with the schools, even smaller schools, to do activities on their own. So we felt we better that was the better path. Hospitals are concerned about uh, they they were very concerned about financial impacts. So again, we the more progressive ones will continue to work with to move forward, but the legislature didn't feel comfortable with the, applying that to all hospitals. All right, I'm just going to fire off. I know you have to leave here in a few minutes. Our, uh, before we lose you, I wanted to ask some of these questions. Any applicability to residential food waste? No. Nope. Any work being done to educate the public about best buy expiration dates or working with companies to reasonably extend the dates? Definitely on uh, yeah, education on how they can manage it better in the home. It's more on the federal level for the actual dates, but there is seems to be movement on the federal level in that regard. Will the state offer incentive funding to promote private recyclers within the geographically strategic areas so that a recycling plant within the 25 miles of, of most generators, or would they incentivize municipalities to offer this service which could be beneficial since they typically have a centrally located transfer station. Uh, yes, the, we will continue through our uh, municipal waste reduction recycling grant program to help municipalities, which includes organics recycling facility funding up to 50%, $2 million cap. On the uh, private side, we are more restrictive because we can't, DEC can't directly fund private entities. But on the municipal side, yes, we'll continue to do funding through MWRNR for municipalities and see if there's other funding programs as well. We just completed a funding cycle for municipalities for all aspects of food scraps, which was over $2 million as well. Okay, we have some other questions from some of the other speakers, so I'll hold on those for now, knowing that you have to leave. Just maybe the last question I'll ask you is the average cost of feasibility studies and is there funding from the state for these types of studies? Uh, the cost varies, but actually in one of our, uh, the recent funding program that just ended a couple months ago, some of the municipalities had applied for feasibility studies and they're considered eligible for that program. So I, if memory serves, it was somewhere around $100,000 was the total project. But again, it, it would vary widely depending on the size of the community, the county, or Okay, I want to I want to thank uh, Sally Rowland again from the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, and Materials Management Division. Thank you very much. We know that you had to have to leave, and I wanted to get those questions in. Okay, thank you very much, Sally. Uh, we'll go now to uh, Oneida County, Oneida Herkimer uh, Food to Energy Program, and with us here to discuss the great work on food diversion uh, is uh, Bill Rabia, the Executive Director. Bill, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay, Steve? We can. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me and uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, uh, describe our program. We're happy to, uh, excited about it, happy to uh, uh, provide information on what we've done so far, and we'd be happy to work with you and Alex on, uh, on a group tour if that's something you'd like to do in the future, Steve. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, it is, Bill. So I'll be coordinating with you and letting everyone know about the group tour. We're going to schedule that in August. Very good. Very good. So I'd like to start by just describing uh, an overview of who we are and what we do um, and really highlight a very unique opportunity we had um, with our neighbors, the Oneida County Sewer District, um, and a big investment in anaerobic digestion and upgrades at their plant 
which allowed us to uh, consider co-digestion. And that's what our uh, food to energy program is all about. It's about uh, co-digestion of organic slurry from source separated organic food waste, um, co-digesting that with the uh, septic waste that the Oneida County Sewer District is treating. Um, I'm gonna describe how our uh, uh, the equipment we're installing and the deep packaging works and how it gets to uh, their facility and, and just review our uh, timeline on how we started and where we are right now. Next slide, please. So uh, the Solid Waste Authority, we're a local public authority. We were formed uh, uh, over 30 years ago now, uh, back in 1988. And uh, we represent Oneida and Herkimer counties, roughly 300,000 residents. Uh, we represent them re related to a uh, planning unit for solid waste management. Uh, we put together the first local solid waste management plan, um, which we completed all elements of, and uh, we're into our second plan. And we've recently uh, submitted our uh, biennial review with a, a two-year extension, um, which uh, furthers our food to energy program. There's elements in that which will further this program. Um, our region in the Mohawk Valley, we uh, have roughly uh, 77 uh, municipalities in our in our two counties. Next slide, please. So we, uh, as part of our original local solid waste management plan, we developed a number of facilities which uh, we currently own and operate. It includes a uh, our large uh, single stream recycling center, which is uh, co-located with our new food to energy plant. Um, that's in Utica, New York a large uh, aerobic yard waste composting site, which we've operated since 1993. We produce a uh, nice compost, which we sell in bulk and we sell it bagged. We have a permanent household hazardous waste collection facility, um, open year round for certain waste, um, six months a year for uh, your liquid chemicals and your paints. That's been operating since 1993. Um, we have a land land clearing debris disposal facility, three solid waste transfer stations. We own and operate a regional landfill with a landfill gas to energy facility. Um, we're currently capturing methane and producing enough electricity to uh, power 3,800 homes annually. And we're looking to add, add engines to that facility. And then uh, my, my topic today will really concentrate on our new organics processing facility. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on these numbers because previous speakers really hit it. I think uh, most of the listeners know why we would target food waste. Obviously, it's a big part of our uh, our waste stream, and uh, the goal is to divert it from the landfill and more efficiently capture methane um, and uh, beneficially utilize that. Next slide, please. Um, so our 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 program is in line with the uh, EPA food waste hierarchy. Um, we in no way is part of our educational program, which I'm gonna describe. Um, obviously priority one is uh, reducing and then using uh, any food waste for feed, whether it be for people or animals. Um, we have found through our surveys that uh, roughly 40% of what would be classified as food waste is already being diverted um, in our region, and it's primarily by the grocers. Uh, they do a great job in uh, actually uh, providing uh, donations to our soup kitchens and our and our uh, um, charities such as that. So we're uh, we in no way want to get in the way of that. In fact, we're hoping to help it. But uh, the program is truly designed for that. Uh, the true waste scraps, and we designed our program to eliminate a number of the common hurdles related to composting of food waste. Uh, next slide, please. So the opportunity we had is the fact that Oneida County uh, was investing roughly $300 million in upgrading their main uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, I mentioned earlier, we are co-located. We essentially share a fence line which uh, presented the very unique opportunity from uh, a logistics, uh, transportation, uh, material handling perspective, um, which really helped uh, the economics of this project. Um, and 
the fact that Oneida County was footing the bill for the two new large anaerobic digesters, they're, uh, they're uh, oversized to uh, essentially solve some real wastewater treatment problems in our region um, and combine sewer issues. Um, the fact that they were investing in these two 1.2 million gallon uh, digesters uh, obviously helped our pro forma greatly. Um, next slide, please. So this is an, an aerial view of our complex in Utica. Our the long building on the right side of the print is uh, the authorities complex. Uh, we have uh, in-ground truck scales. We process you know 300 transactions a day, whether it be uh, incoming recyclables, uh, waste for that goes through a transfer station that was transferred to our landfill. Our yard waste compost site is actually at that facility, just not in the picture. And the little highlighted yellow block on the uh, small part of that uh, building on the right is is the addition that we put on. We put on we modified our solid waste transfer station permit, uh, put an addition with a new tipping floor to be able to receive source separated organics. Um, in that building, we house depackaging equipment, and uh, that's where we will essentially depackage, debag source separated organics. Uh, produce the organic slurry, and then the slurry will go right next door to those uh, yellow highlighted globes at the uh, top of uh, the wastewater treatment facility. Those are the anaerobic digesters, and uh, again, the slurry will be co-digested with their septic waste. The wastewater treatment plant has uh, microturbines in place, and they plan to utilize 100% of the electricity generated to um, uh, towards their operation use in their plant. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, and we started on my timelines uh, a little further in the presentation, but we started our process uh, prior to the, uh, obviously prior to uh, the recent mandate, and we were really targeting those large generators looking for the biggest bang for our buck. Um, we have a, a good number of local generators that really don't fall under the new mandate that are very interested and in, have already begun either diverting um, their SSO, their source separated organic food waste, or starting pilot projects. Those include our local hospitals, um, our colleges. We have a couple of community colleges. Um, uh, SUNY uh, Polytechnic is in Utica. Uh, Hamilton College had been diverting food waste for years. Uh, trying to compost it, and they've actually are now uh, sending their waste to us. Uh, it's allowed them to expand their program. Um, we have a number of large cafeteria businesses that really would not fall under uh, the mandate currently that are um, working on now segregating their organics to send to us. And uh, obviously, we're working with grocery chains, and we have a few food uh, manufacturers in our region. I mentioned earlier, uh, roughly 40 to 50% of our food waste is already diverted, and that really, that information came to us based upon surveying of the generators as part of our feasibility study when we uh, began to look at this project. Um, so we've sized the facility um, for a maximum of around 20, 21,000 tons annually, and uh, that actually would be the, the food waste in our current waste shed, uh, including residential food waste. Um, we are currently um, giving residents opportunity to bring bagged SSO to our eco drops. Um, that's if they cannot compost it in their backyard if they happen to live in uh, uh, the city and apartments and they're unable to do that. Uh, we are giving them an opportunity to do that. Next slide, please. So we, uh, we've worked over the last couple of years on um, uh, branding uh, the program and educating those generators. A big part of the education is, is uh, generator to, to uh, authority conversations. We're reaching right out to those large generators. Um, we are working with them related to uh, labeling, posters, education of their workers. Um, so it'll essentially be a three bin pro uh, system. Uh, they'll have uh, three bins, whether it be in their kitchens or 
uh, post-consumer in their restaurants or in their cafeterias. Uh, they'll have a bin for the food scraps and energy, a bin for Recycle One, the single stream recyclables, and then your landfill bin. And, and many of you, I'm sure, have seen these three bin systems uh, elsewhere. Next slide, please. So the bulk of our facility is really uh, related to depackaging equipment. We've invested in uh, Scott Manufacturing, uh, the Thor Durbo turbo depackager um, and they, these equipment there's a number of them operating out uh, down in the New York City area and uh, really across the country and elsewhere um, they, these, this equipment was originally designed by the food manufacturing industry where they had a need to uh, depackage uh, tractor trailer loads of off spec uh, um, food waste that uh, they wanted to either compost or digest um, They've been sort of tweaked a little bit to allow for more of a, a mixed waste stream. And now uh, you see more and more material managers um, looking to this equipment. Um, we'll be able to, with this equipment, accept uh, source-separated organics in bags, in clear bags, or in original packaging. And um, we're going to be charging $40 a ton tipping fee. Um, all the material will go through the depackager and then that affluent or that slurry will ultimately be uh, tankered over to the United County Sewer District. Next slide, please. So uh, going clockwise, starting in the upper left of this slide, um, you can see uh, the upper left, that's uh, actually the addition to our building. Um, this is, uh, these, these photos were taken a few weeks ago. Um, we have uh, a new tip floor, with uh, moisture collection, uh, that's the middle upper slide. You can actually see workers in there, but that's that's our tipping area. Trucks, uh, whether they're using traditional uh, solid waste trucks or uh, more like a rendering truck, or even uh, we can accept palletized material. It'll be received through this tipping area. There's a feed hopper on the the right side of that tipping floor where we will uh, use traditional equipment, whether it be skid steers or wheel loaders to load the equipment into a feed hopper. That will come down to uh, uh, the depackagers. If you look directly below the tipping floor picture, that's a shot looking into the depackaging equipment. That's your Thor depackager. Um, this equipment really involves screens and swing hammers that will essentially push or squeeze the organics out of the packaging and uh, then the slurry will go into a number of mixing tanks you see on the right hand side the blue tank and then that large silver tank on the bottom those are our mixing tanks and holding tanks uh, and then the slurry will be brought next door um, we're actually in um, the equipment has all been being run with water this week um, the manufacturers are there testing uh, working on uh, meters and level meters and uh, we hope to actually process our first load of SSO um, Wednesday or Thursday of this week. Um, we're obviously coordinating very closely with the project next door as that $300 million project is is underway and they've uh, in the last quarter began actually running the digesters. So everything's sort of timing out where uh, uh, it's going to work out from a timing perspective where we'll be able to digest this uh, next slide, please. So uh, digestion really put simply is uh, our uh, SSO waste will be going into uh, these large anaerobic digesters that have the septic waste or the sewage in it. And uh, it's been proven in a number of studies that when you add this uh, organic slurry or the food waste, it uh, will help the plant produce more gas, cleaner gas, higher BTU gas, help them produce more electricity. Uh, next slide, please. And 100% of that gas is captured, again, at the landfill as efficiently as we try to uh, capture gas. We're really in the 85 to 90% range, and there truly is some fugitive emissions. So that's the uh, um, uh, part of the beauty of uh, sending it to the digester is you're capturing 100% of the gas. And in our case, we're actually saving on uh, uh, fuel consumption and not having to transport the waste to our regional landfill. So we began this uh, process back in 2016. We initiated a feasibility study. 
Um, the feasibility study determined the project would be roughly $3.4 million. Um, utilizing that feasibility study, we applied for a number of grants and we were fortunate to receive uh, Climate Smart Community Grants money and uh, $1.3 million in change. And then we also applied to Sally's, uh, the MWRR grant program. We received another uh, quarter million there. So we have roughly 50% of the cost of the program in grant money. Uh, we began the design and construction in late 2018. Um, as I mentioned, we have just fired up the machines. We we uh, are finishing construction and hope to process our first load this week. We began accepting SSO on May 6th. Uh, we've been uh, now receiving uh, two separate loads a week. We are receiving roughly 10 tons a week coming from uh, colleges, institutions, and uh, some grocers, there's some great interest from uh, our local food packaging industry for us to process off spec, um, out uh, off spec for whatever reason, food. Um, so we'll be testing with that soon. Um, and the generator outreach goes on. We have been, again, uh, going in the institutions, training them with uh, help, helping train their workers helping label their containers to uh, build up that feedstock. Uh, next slide, please. And that's, uh, I know we're pressed for time, so I brushed through that. And uh, Steve, I'll hand it back to you and we can take questions. Okay, that's terrific. Again, we're gonna, thank you, Bill Rabia. We're gonna do an August tour and we'll let folks know who are on this webinar about that. We're also gonna follow up that August tour of the Oneida Herkimer uh, facility located in Utica, New York, uh, almost central New York. Uh, we're gonna follow that up with a, uh, a, a, um, a live workshop on September 17th in um, Sullivan County, where the Association of Counties will be having its workshop. Um, we're also going to uh, um, continue to reach out to some larger producers um, like um, Price Chopper and Wegmans and include them in this discussion uh, and uh, also um, note that climate, through the Climate Smart Community Program that grant funding uh, is available uh, and other materials are available to start this initiative. Let me go to uh, Mana Joe, if Mana Joe is still with us, um, regarding food rescues for animals. What's the best best method for enc encouraging? Okay, we 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 lost that question just a minute here, Manager. Joe. We'll be right back. What's the best method uh, for encouraging the diversion uh, to farms? Do most farmers wish to participate and accept the food waste? Uh, what type of food waste is usually acceptable to the farmers? And are farmers exempt from the DEC regulation? Wow, uh, I don't know that I am an expert on that. I, what I do know is that um, formally and informally, there is a lot of food waste in Ulster County being devoted, uh, being um, diverted to farms. And when we developed this legislation, one of our legislators is a farmer and he wanted to be sure that our legislation and the state legislation allowed those practices to continue, uh, mostly to feed uh, livestock, to feed hogs and, and other livestock. Um, and I believe things like uh, beer mash and a whole variety, um, apple waste and, and so forth, things that could be composted, but also can provide um, uh, you know, a, a source of food for animals. I uh, will be looking for that question um, to try to get more details on the answers. I apologize, and if any of our other presenters know more, uh, please take it. All right, the next question that we have for Mana Joe is, what is the name of the app that can be used uh, that you spoke of? Um, I think that, uh, uh, is that the HV? Uh, yes. Feed, Hut Feed HV, could you talk about that Chow Match app? Um, 
Uh, let's see. I, I have a little brochure on it. Again, you know, I didn't develop this app, but it is Community Food Networking, and it's uh, feedhv.org. And if you go on their website, there's the opportunity um, to sign up uh, to um, to get the app and to put it onto your cell phone. I just think it's a really unique system um, where they match uh, drive, volunteer drivers and transportation with um, food pantries um, and other places to use the food. And if for some reason that doesn't work, then um, there are composting facilities uh, that will accept it. And they're very, 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 they're all very careful about, you, you know, the, the health precautions and standards. Uh, Bill Rabia, um, a couple of questions. Do you provide or sell food waste bins or containers to the residents to promote food waste composting? Uh, if so, uh, how well does it work? We do not. So uh, the, the first point is we're continuing to educate our residents, our homeowners, to um, compost in their backyard. I mean, uh, uh, as, as Mana Joe mentioned, from an environmental standpoint, um, that's really the best thing. And we live in a pretty rural community up here in Anita Herkimer where most folks can do that. Um, so we encourage that. We do, we've started the process working with our local haulers. So there's a number of haulers out there that um, most of them are targeting the larger waste generators, the commercial generators, whether they're providing toters or specialized bins for their SSO. But there is actually uh, a local hauler that um, markets to residential folks that cannot or do not choose to compost in their backyard, and they will provide them with a bin and actually charge for that service and bring it to us. Um, and then, as I mentioned, homeowners could bring it to our eco drops if they're in a circumstance where they can compost as well. Uh, Bill Rabia, will Oneida be monitoring and reporting on the impact of this effort on the level of food contamination, food contaminated recyclable material? Will they be creating educational material, how to handle uh, food reduce food contamination of recyclable material to both commercial and residential populations? Sure, well, we're anxious to fire the system up so then we can start, you know, providing some of those metrics and looking at the metrics. Um, you know, we've looked at the industry standards for these packagers and how much residue actually comes with the SSO. So we're, um, and we developed a pro forma and based our tipping fee on a, a number of, uh, industry standards so we're anxious to uh, be able to quantify residues and and look at those res uh you know different contaminants that may come in um the generators coming in the gate right now are actually um we're gearing up to go to composting so um from our characterization of waste since may 6th it is uh nice clean waste um from from a material manager standpoint so yeah, we will definitely be, and that's part of our reporting to the state, we'll be looking at all those numbers. Okay, well, we're joined by Carrie Ross, the HV Feed, uh, the, app, the app program manager, manager for HV Feed. Uh, Carrie, are you uh, able to talk at this point in time? Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We uh, thank you for joining us. We did have a question about feed HV. Uh, yeah. Perhaps you could take just a minute here because we are uh, going late into this webinar here about this app, uh, how it started, and how folks can get a hold of you to talk about it further. So you know the the app is more than uh, is about more than just recovering uh, food from events. It's actually about recovering all different kinds of food waste from restaurants or corporate dining halls, farms. It uh, was started by uh, the funder for the majority of the emergency feeding programs in the Mid Hudson Valley who noticed that their programs all needed logistics of volunteers and drivers and transportation and all the donors needed the coordination of the uh, for their donation so they didn't throw it out. Um, you can go to 
www.feedhv.org uh, in order to register as a volunteer or a donor or a recipient agency and you can read more about it there and feed hv is the name of the of the campaign the uh software program and the mobile app we use is called chow match and it's free to use for us i should say it's free to use okay. for us it covers ulster sullivan duchess Put, uh, putnam uh green columbia and orange counties Okay, uh, that was Carrie Ross. And Carrie, do you want to leave your email for folks? Sure, it's C J Ross, C J Ross, R O S S, at H V A D C dot org. Is, would it be useful if I put it in the uh, text box? Yeah, if you could shoot that on here, we'll make sure the participants have that. Thanks so much, Carrie. Sure. Thanks uh, for uh, asking me. Yep, uh, certainly. Um, uh, Manager, uh, can any of the compost in your Ulster Resource Recovery Agency uh, compost, um, uh, it, it sounds like you're composting over 5,000 tons per year. Can you talk for a minute about that? Manager, are you Let's with us? See. Yes, I am. Um, let's see. Uh, I, th I think it 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 was um, 3,500 tons uh, of food waste that UCRA is doing, but we have um, three other active composting facilities as well. I'm not quite understanding the question. Well, I, I guess the question was more of a, it wasn't a question, it was a comment, and it was uh, how well you're doing. Uh, with with that composting oh. program, so, so it was more of a compliment. I I read it as a question, but it was more of a uh, compliment. So thank you. All of them are doing extremely well, and um, I wanted to add we also have uh, composting now going on at some of our transfer stations, so residents can bring in food waste. And then on a weekly basis, that's brought to a composting facility. And one of our transfer stations composts uh, right on site. The other thing I wanted to mention is one of the reasons we are including schools and healthcare facilities is that there are such good examples already in Ulster County that we didn't feel we needed to exempt them. There are considerations with healthcare facilities about um, you know, uh, contamination if, if somebody um, uh, has an illness that could be spread. And so, you know, there there is definitely going to be opportunity for appropriate waivers um, and also an iterative process where uh, as we go from the higher amounts of uh, food waste generation to the moderate amounts we will be sure that it's it's appropriate and if it's not uh then you know we'll we'll make modifications if we need to but we think we can go uh to half a ton especially if we um exempt post consumer which can we found out from example at SUNY New Pulse they do extremely well in the controlled situations in the um cafeterias that are in the dorms, but in the food courts, uh, it's almost impossible to keep contamination out. That's where that issue came up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Manager. Joe. Let me just end by saying the Ithaca uh, area wastewater treatment facility has been creating biogas with slurry for decades. Uh, we will incorporate the Ithaca area wastewater treatment facility and what they are doing uh, for our September conference and bring them in to talk about the great work that they've done. Uh, and I guess uh, perhaps to Bill Rabia, uh, uh, is there any education on using waste? Um, uh, uh, Jeanette, can we go back to that question? Uh, is there any uh, um, material for education efforts on uh, trying to capture uh, waste disposal units on residential sinks? Uh, to, that grind uh, food into the sink that goes directly into the facility. 
uh, for digestion. How can uh, that be captured? Um, it's worth noting for residents, if, it, if waste goes down a drain, at least in Ithaca area, it will go to the wastewater facility. Uh, do you have any education on using waste disposal units on sinks to grind food? Yeah, so that, that question is really for the wastewater treatment guys, but um, communities across the state vary in their regulations on whether they allow or not. You know, in some cases, uh, the uh, food disposal in your sink uh, created piping problems. Some, some municipalities, you know, have regulations on them. In the Oneida County Sewer District situation, if a business or a home is using them, that slurry will ultimately end up in the digesters. So, you know, it's being captured, but there's not at presently a educational movement to encourage them or subsidize them or, or move in that regard. That's not to say in the future they, they may be looking at that. Uh, we're the solid waste guys on the other side of the fence, so we're obviously partnering with them. But that's uh, it's a good point. It depends on the the communities and their infrastructure and whether or not that's something they want to truly encourage. Okay, Bill, and uh, I think Anna Kellis uh, from Ithaca uh, has the best comment here to wrap up this. This was a super inspiring. A webinar to see what's happening around the state and it truly was and I thank you for that comment Anna and really thank you all to all of our panelists who are with us today again we're going to capture these questions and post this webinar and more importantly we're really going to work very closely with the state on grants and with RIT uh, and the Pollution Institute on trying to get resources and more material and help grow this environmentally friendly initiative so thanks to all of our panelists and all our our, our, our members who joined us here today. Thank you very much. This will conclude today's webinar.